Kolkata, India, and I realized that uh, temperature should not be viewed in absolute units, but in relative units. In any case, uh, I am really honored to be here on this occasion to celebrate the achievements of uh, Lev Gorkov and uh, celebrate the impact he has had on our science. <clears throat> so uh, what I'll do today is tell you about superconductor insulator transition and uh, some of the points on which uh, Lev and I interacted and how it shaped the course of uh, some of my own research. So these were the two papers, you all obviously know about them, but I'll bring it uh, in context of the work that I will talk about. Okay, so yesterday I had actually lost my voice completely and I was worried that I wouldn't be able to talk, so I wrote things down, <laughs> but I still, I still left it up there just in case. So um, this is what it says. I first met uh, Lev, I think, in 1994 when I was still at Argonne. Uh, with Abrikosov as my group leader, so I had that point of contrast. <laughs> so um, I visited here um, and I told Lev about my interest in understanding the superconductor to insulator transition in disordered films. Um, I had obtained at that time the phase diagram of the dirty boson problem using the path integral method and I stated to him that if the SIT was in the, uh, in the disordered films, was in the same universality class, then our calculations would be relevant. Uh, he wasn't particularly interested in that statement. Um, but even so, I kind of pushed on. I said, uh, even otherwise, I claimed it would be an interesting model calculation. He wasn't interested in that either. <laughs> so I started to give my talk. And I did not proceed beyond slide two, which is basically that Goldman data you all know about. And for 20 minutes, we had this to and fro between him and me, um, you know, trying to understand what was the data actually saying. And I was obviously keen to put up my next slide with the model and then proceed with the rest of my talk. But no, we weren't going to get there at all. Um, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> overall, I would say, uh, his attitude was disbelieving, but not dismissive. And this meant a lot to me as a young researcher that, you know, we had come that close, that he was not totally dismissive of what I wanted to talk about. And he was never aggressive, even in my ad ad interactions with him later on. And I always had the impression that he was interested in understanding the phenomena very, very deeply. So I came away extremely impressed with him. Now I want to add a few words about Bob Schrieffer as well, because he's again somebody I met more closely when I, I'd met him a couple of times before, but I met him more closely during that 94 visit to, <coughs> to Tallahassee. So another problem I was working on at that time was the attractive U Hubbard model, and we were looking at two temperature scales, a scale where pairing happens as you come down in temperature, separated from another scale where coherence happens, and the pseudo-gap phenomena in between. And at one point I had to say the, the you know, very scary words that the BCS paradigm breaks down in that the two things don't happen at the same temperature. And I was kind of watching his face, but I, I have to say that Bob was perfectly fine with that, and he even embraced the idea. And I, I bring this up because you know, I tell myself as I get older and more rigid, uh, I tell myself I should remain flexible when it comes to new ideas and when it comes to encouraging young people. So these were two important lessons I took away. Okay, now a uh, couple other things. Um, some of that initial work with Vlad and Jim Vallis led to uh, this uh, collected uh, articles that we put together in this book. And this is that famous Goldman data. Anyway, so after that I left Argonne and went back to India to Tata Institute for about 10 years. And during that, I decided, OK, let's move out of this boson uh, constri constraint and look at fermions and see what happens when you have fermions and disorder, still keeping S-wave fermions. So 
there are two energy scales. We have the superconducting gap and the Fermi energy, and they are widely separated. When you turn on disorder, some scale, let's say h bar over tau, ra rather amazingly, this was the work of Anderson and Abrikosov and Gorkov, one of those papers I showed, uh, it sh essentially showed that even when the disorder is on the order of the uh, superconducting gap, superconductivity remains robust. So that was a, a, an important result that they had obtained using uh, essentially perturbation in the disorder. And we wanted to march beyond the perturbative limit to when the disorder, h bar over tau, tau is the sca elastic scattering rate, so this h bar over tau became on the order of EF. And that was where the superconductor to insulator transition was happening, where you got this uh, conductance, which was uh, in units of the uh, uh, quantum of conductance. I'm talking about all of this in two dimensions. And so we wanted to understand the interplay of localization and superconductivity. <clears throat> so um, there, there were many papers here, and I'm just going to summarize everything in one phase diagram. So um, starting from this early works, you can see there is almost a pseudo gap here itself of a decade uh, between the initial works that we did. This one was mainly doing mean field theory, keeping the inhomogeneity. And part of the reason for the pseudo gap is <coughs> some of the results we got were <coughs> <Sorry>. <coughs> I should be okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry for this, but okay, let me just say what the results are. So at zero disorder, this is what is happening. This is the energy gap. This is a typical BCS scenario. The energy gap comes down, vanishes at TC. The superfluid stiffness, which is the response to a boundary condition where you twist the phases, also vanishes at TC. Now, when you turn on disorder, what we found using this boglyabov degen method, where we kept the inhomogeneity in the order parameter, solved for itself consistently, is that the gap remained finite um, all through. So in other words, there was no Anderson insulator in this, in this uh, in the Anderson insulator with gapless excitations. In fact, the gap was finite for arbitrarily large disorder, but the superfluid stiffness vanished at some critical point. And this critical point now on the insulating side has pairs, but it can be, uh, it, it goes soft by another energy scale, and that is the Josephson scale. So if you try to tunnel two particles into the insulator, there is a gap, uh, there is, uh, in the superconductor, there is no gap to that, so that is zero here. So the Josephson scale, is zero inside the superconductor, but in the insulator, there is a finite cost to tunneling a Cooper pair in, or, or a pair in, into the insulator, but that scale also goes soft at the transition. So this is the way we can describe this quantum phase transition in the S-wave superconductor. Okay. Now, uh, these calculations, uh, to get actually the transition, you can't get it within mean field theory, as you all know. You have to go beyond that, and you have to keep the fluctuations around this inhomogeneous state, and that was done using Monte Carlo techniques. Now, furthermore, we also went on to study, uh, <clears throat> as you know, in, the, in a superconductor, there is a delta function peak at zero frequency, um, and, um, uh, and this essentially describes the accelerating uh, fermions. And as you add disorder, and the strength of the peak is essentially given by rho s, right? So there is a peak at zero frequency, then there is a gap above that, and then the two part, then the broken pairs beyond some gap energy. Now, as you add disorder, if the superfluid stiffness is going down, there is a sum rule on the optical conductivity, and so there's an obvious question, where is that weight going? And that was the whole uh, question of what is happening to the Higgs modes and so on. 
So we also address that question here. So pretty much in the S-Wave case, we have a very good understanding of all the aspects of superconductivity and the insulating phases. Okay, so the next challenge was to come to D-Wave superconductor plus disorder. <coughs> and uh, here, I uh, interestingly met uh, Lev Gorkov a second time. I'd met him several times at conferences, but you know, those interactions are short. So this was another kind of interesting uh, uh, interaction that happened when I came here for a seminar that Vlad invited me to. And uh, clearly, uh, disorder and D-wave was a topic close to uh, Lev's heart. That was the second paper I mentioned. Uh, you can either view it as magnetic impurities uh, in S-wave superconductors and the uh, analysis very similar to looking at D-wave with non-magnetic impurities. <coughs> so we had found a pretty a remarkable result, which I'll show you in a bit. And um, I could see this time, Lev was clearly hooked. And during and after my talk, he was, well, uh, he this time at least believed the results, but he was, uh, you know, these results were obtained numerically. And he was clearly interested in going to the heart of that uh, phenomena. And, <clears throat> Let me have another sip. Hopefully I can get by. <coughs> <coughs> okay, so um, uh, he clearly wanted to go beyond the simulations to the heart of the physics. And even on the S-wave case, he was very uh, happy to see that we had in extended the calculations to, the, to fermions and uh, the, the whole picture that emerged, which I haven't shown you in detail here because this is all published work, but the picture that emerged in terms of puddles, how the superconductivity gets reorganized inhomogeneously, and that is at the heart of why these phenomena are happening, was uh, something we had interesting discussions on. Okay, so let me just quickly uh, tell you about uh, what was the D-Wave story. So this is data from uh, Seamus Davis's group, very old data now, um, where uh, they look at scanning tunneling spectroscopy on BISCO with uh, oxygen uh, d doping, uh, and they get these different colored pictures. Uh, they basically tell you regions of high conductance and low conductance. And when you plot them out, let's say these different regions, they show one remarkable feature that stands out, whereas the <coughs> behavior at the coherence peaks is very different depending on whether you're at a high conductance region that has a sharp coherence peak or a low conductance region that is more broad. But what is, <coughs> what is uh, kind of stands out is the low energy v, v in the density of states is extremely robust. And the question is, why is it so robust across very large uh, changes in doping? So, of course, you can point to many factors <coughs> that, you know, the intrinsic disorder is lying off the plane. Uh, the coherence length is very short. These are all very uh, uh, understandable reasons why superconductivity should be robust. But um, nevertheless, uh, it seemed to be, you can't just explain it with these two features. There was some greater degree of protection. So once again, we uh, come to the second classic work of Ab uh, Abrikosov and Gorkov, that for non-magnetic impurities in D-wave superconductors, they had done a T-matrix approach based on diagrammatic perturbation theory, and again showed that this time, TC and superfluid stiffness are destroyed when, uh, when the scattering rate uh, or scattering time or scattering rate, let's say, is on the order of the, of the gap. Um, but uh, somehow in the experiments, uh, they seem to be insensitive to a much greater degree of disorder to EF tau of order one. So there's a big separation there. And the question is, why is this happening? So can it be explained by just short coherence length and so on, or is there something more? And uh, the answer is that there is something more. Uh, and that something more is <coughs> that high TC superconductors are not just 
uh, you know, you can't, it's not just a BCS type superconductor with D wave order parameter, but strong Coulomb correlations or this no double occupancy constraint is also playing a major role. So we can do two different calculations. This is a calculation that keeps the lower one that I call BDG is a calculation <coughs> that keeps all the disorder and the D-wave order parameter and the inhomogeneity. You know, so it, it of course goes beyond T matrix, but it keeps all of that structure. And then you can look at your density of states for different degrees of impurities. So here the disorder is more or less like a point impurity because it's coming from oxygen, uh, you know, um, uh, stoichiometry, de-stoichiometry. Okay, and what you find is clearly there is um, low energy uh, suppression. Uh, so let's see, 0.01 is the pink one. That's the least uh, disordered. As you add disorder toward higher disorder, almost 25%, you see there is some filling up of the gap. But when you include the strong Coulomb constraints, then you see this a complete protection of the low energy weight. And this, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, very much consistent with the experiments. But now that we have the numerics, we were able to go into this <coughs> and dissect the origin of uh, where this phenomenon is coming from. And a lot of this discussion um, uh, happened with uh, Lev Gorkov. I'm only going to give you a small gist here, and that is just to say that <clears throat> the crucial thing in destroying this uh, pat, this low energy protection is that in a D-wave superconductor, you have uh, lobes of your order parameter that have positive and negative phases. That's the structure of the D-wave function. Now, <clears throat> if the disorder could only scatter within one of the lobes, you would protect the, the gap structure. But at these degrees of disorder, 25%, you're not really going to, to, uh, pre to really prevent that internodal inter scattering. But what we found is, <coughs> what we found remarkably was that, once again, because of um, the inhomogeneity, superconductivity reorganizes itself. So regions that are really bad for superconductivity, that's actually insulating. And the regions where the disorder is small, that's where the superconductivity tends to, uh, to originate. And in those regions, indeed, you suppress internodal scattering and preserve the gap. Um, so it's kind of this mixed K and real space picture, but it's actually very intuitive. Okay, so um, I just wanted to add my last few comments about uh, Lev, and uh, just to say that you know I've met many great physicists, and um, you know it's kind of interesting. Some of them are very sure that you know they know everything, and in many ways this lack of humility comes in the way of their growth, if I may say so. <clears throat> now Lev, I note well, had a had was open to discussions of all types of phenomena, and. He had a wry sense of humor, and he was extremely respectful of other people's views. And I was initially a little scared of him, I must say. Um, he is such a towering figure. But I can say as my discussion started, I realized that if you were serious, he would listen to you quietly and respectfully, but not give in unless all his questions were answered. So in that sense, I learned a lot from him and from his approach, even through a few interactions. Now, as you have seen already from the, just the snippet of results I've shown you, that uh, mine is a more numerical approach, uh, but discussions with Lev forced me to understand parts of my results analytically, or at least semi-analytically. And I realized that by adding analytical insights to numerics, which I can perform in regions that are non-perturbative, and really that's the most important reason to do numerics. It takes you out of some quantity being, some uh, uh, coupling constant being either very small or very large, 
but go to a regime where the coupling is of order one. But if you leave it there, then you've kind of lost the best part of your results. And that is to get a handle on the analytical insights of that numerics. And so in the disorder problem, I just want to return to this for a brief moment. <clears throat> One of the things it got us looking at again was to understand the Bogliebov degen results even more simply by using exact eigenstates. The idea proposed by Anderson of pairing of exact eigenstates where you find the one particle states with disorder and then introduce um, uh, attraction on that. And we did this both for the S wave case and for the D wave case, and they gave us tremendous insights into, uh, in the S wave case, why is the gap constant across the transition? Because one of the things people never believed is when you have disorder, they always felt there will be some tail of states that will fill in a gap. That's the first instinct, and that is not correct, at least for these kinds of models. So it gave us insight into that, and it also gave us into insights into why, that D, uh, why the low energy density of states is protected. And almost a decade later, Kraftsov and Feigelman have taken these uh, ideas to, uh, to new levels. But we did it almost in 98, where we, laid, we took Anderson's ideas, but we pushed it in a regime where we could go to much higher disorder. Uh, EF tau of order one. Okay. Next phase. Am I almost all up? Are you trying to stand up to tell me I'm up? I'm standing up because I need to just or are you tired of my voice? <laughs> <laughs> no. Please, please okay. Here, oh, okay. Because now I was coming to some new stuff. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, this throws me off my uh, the speed with which I can say things. Okay. So next thing, we want to get even simpler. We want to try to understand even clean systems. Usually one would have gone in this direction, clean to disordered, but we are really going disordered to clean because we are always looking for that you know, nugget of simplicity. So here, uh, the, okay, let me skip this because I think uh, uh, Patrick will talk about it. Let me cover to uh, this, this thing. So let's go to the other, other way of looking at the problem. Let me start with even a band insulator and ask, how can it become a superconductor? So in other words, the question we are asking, it's, it's you know, one of the ways we have approached this problem of a clean system is to take a Fermi surface and look at the instability around it. Then comes the next point. If the glue becomes very strong, then clearly a large part of the Fermi surface is getting destroyed, and that's the BCS to BEC crossover. But you can push it to the extreme limit and say, well, what happens if there was no Fermi surface at all? What happens if it was a band insulator or any kind of insulator with no other broken symmetry? So we have just answered. Let me give you the answer in one little schematic here, but there's a whole calculation that goes with it, and it's published in this recent paper. <clears throat> so what we show is that there's no direct way to go from a Fermi insulator to a BCS superconductor. You have to go through two crossovers. The first is a crossover from a Fermi band insulator to a Bose insulator. And what th distinguishes these two is that the lowest energy excitation is a charge E fermion. And here, the lowest energy excitation becomes a charge 2E boson. And that's what goes soft at the transition. So in other words, before an insulator becomes a superconductor, you should already be able to detect the signatures of pairs in the insulator. And this is a very strong statement. And then it's these bosons that would both condense into a BEC, and, and this condensation will happen in momentum space at the gamma point. And it's then another crossover from this gamma point uh, B BEC to a BCS superconductor as you change some parameter. So, uh, okay, maybe I'm out of time here. Uh, so I'm just at 25 at this point, I noticed. So 
few, I'll just end in a few seconds. Okay, okay, I will, I will end very shortly. So uh, a way to realize that scenario is the following. Um, I take a different sites here. Each site has two levels. Uh, because I want a band insulator, I need at least two levels per site. And this level is, is fully occupied. So that when you include tunneling, you essentially get two bands. In the absence of any attraction, there is a band closing at a critical value of the tunneling relative to the band gap in the single, or in the single site. Right? This is a particular realization of a band insulator. When you include attraction now, you fix the attraction once again, change the tunneling, you see that you can create these two excitations in the band insulator, and these excitations can, uh, the binding energy can actually drop below the single particle excitation. And that's when it becomes a Bose insulator. And this Bose insulator then undergoes BEC, which is essentially condensate in, at momentum equal to zero, and that minimum gap locus then undergoes a topological change uh, from a single point to a whole Fermi surface. Okay, so I won't, uh, I won't uh, tell you too much more, but essentially you get a whole phase diagram in the, uh, in the space of attraction and tunneling, and it embodies all of these four phases. Now, what has been fa interesting about this problem is we had to attack it with many different methods. No one method can give you this whole diagram. But this is the first time I saw mean field theory, which I really love. It gives you 90% of the result most in many cases. In this case, fail terribly uh, and not get the Bose insulating phase at all. And we had to go to Mo Monte Carlo methods. Okay, so I'll kind of end with that and just and with my collaborators. Um, this was the early work uh, the, on S-wave and D-wave. This was including quantum phase fluctuations on it. And this is now the new thing, which I haven't talked about, where we are looking at topological insulators and topological superconductors and transitions between them, and also the work on quantum Hall insulator to superconductors. And really, my all-time collaborator, Mohit Randeria. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's yeah, it's controlled by the. So we are always keeping the, we are always keeping the chemical potential in the in the metal. Yeah. I like to disagree with your statement that in the cuprates, uh, superconductivity uh, transition temperature goes to zero when EF tau, so by tau I mean the tau that comes in resistivity goes to one. Well, so uh, what, sorry, what's the question? Are you talking about elastic versus inelastic? So I think maybe you're referring to the uh, optimally doped, you know, where you get this linear is. Ah. Uh, you didn't say that uh, superconductivity in, in the scoop rates disappears when EF tau equals one, did you? No. I know. I'm just saying that's. Not for coup rates, for S wave, for S wave. Uh, S wave. No, in cuprates, I said the expectation is that when delta tau is, I think, I think what you're referring to is, I, this, this is what you're referring to. This, you know, this is, this is just early, so I'm talking about this. Yeah, this one. Well, that's not a Charles experiment. I agree with Chandra. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, it's, all I'm trying to say is that 
there was early data. This is, uh, you know, where, okay, so all I'm trying to say is that this, if you do weak coupling, uh, you know, perturbative disorder, then you expect delta tau to be of order one. But super, in these cube rates, you can have much higher degrees of disorder and it's still your... Uh,